All right. So I have with me today, Derek Lunsford. He's the current 212 Mr. Olympia champion. We don't know if he's going to compete in the 212 or in the open next year. We're going to ask him, but really happy to have you. And so thanks for being here. Hey, Greg, thanks for having me. I know we were going to do this a couple weeks back, but we finally made it happen today. So appreciate you having me, man. Absolutely. And for me, it's a big honor. I've been a fan ever since you turned pro. I watched you turn pro and was like, wow, this guy looks freaky. He had the best genetics to shape and you continued and you eventually earned that Mr. Olympia title and you just keep improving. Yeah. Five years knocking on the door of that 212 title and finally, uh, finally made it happen, man. So I feel grateful and blessed to be able to be the 212 Olympia champion now. And so personally for me, I see you as this guy like with the Chris Bumstead type of genetics, the kind of guy that could win a title over and over and over again, especially in the 212 class. But it seems as though you're you're getting so much size. I watch a video. You you were with Eric Konevsky. He measured your height and you were like five, six and a half with shoes. I do think I'm a bit taller than you. 257 pounds. How Come are on. you going to make 212? Give me give me the five, six and a half, will you? With or without shoes. Come on. You're like me. You're like me. I always round up. (laughs) Exactly. No, man. Um, Yeah. Like coming off the 212 Olympia title last year, I, I just was so motivated, you know, after getting that title that I just wanted to head right back in the gym and make improvements for this year. And there was, there's been really no plan of going open this year at all. Um, I just really was like eager to get back in the gym and, and keep training. And some guys, they rest on their victories. For me, it just motivates me even more. So that's kind of what happened after last year was I just got super motivated coming off the Olympia and I just, I just stayed with it since. And so I, I, I heard you say something like you've come from around 250 pounds in the past and made 212. And so now you feel you can still do it, but you'd have to sacrifice muscle. And so my main question is, why are you adding the muscle in the first place? If you just need to make 212, like you, you must weigh yourself every week. Like when you get to say 245, do you not think, well, that's big enough. I'm just going to like slow down now. Maybe I'll take yeah. tomorrow off. Definitely. And actually, you know, around the, Pittsburgh pro guest posing time. Um, Hani and I were, were, I was training hard and we were staying in close communication as we always do. And I hit that 245 and he said, okay, let's keep it right there. And I said, okay, perfect. I was eating clean. You know, we were on very low carbs and I was eating five, six meals a day and my weight went to 245 to 247. And he said, okay, let's, let's get it. Let's keep it there. Like, let's not get any higher. 50. And he's like, okay, that's, that's a little too heavy. We need to bring it back down to mid 240s. And I said, okay. And then it got to 252. And this is, again, without like going crazy, a bunch of cheat meals. This was just me doing cardio, me training hard, and me eating my normal meals. And then it creeped up all the way to, I would say, close to about 260 almost. And, um, and that's what you guys saw at the, the guest posing in Pittsburgh. And then um, – yeah. So since then, I, th- there's been really no plan of me trying to gain that weight. It was me more or less going, hey, I see these areas of improvement that I'd like to make. I'd like to get a little stronger here, get a little, little, add a little bit more muscle tissue there. And I think just a couple pounds here and a couple pounds there has equated to the overall muscle size. Because like I said, you know, if I just stayed the same like like i had every year and come back down to 212 that i would have the same physique for me i want to improve my physique so adding a couple pounds here and a couple pounds there is what i think has happened and so i mean i I don't know if everyone's seen this but i saw you at that guest posing and it was mind-blowing like it was shocking to me like i knew you were good but when i saw you there i was like really is he that good like i mean we're, we're blowing up your horn or whatever you know um but your physique was incredible. It looked like, how is he actually going to compete at 212? Because I was like, th- in my mind, I was like, this guy is going to win the 212 year after year after year and just dominate. It's not even close. I saw you win last year. And so a few people said it was close. In my mind, I was like, are you kidding? Are you guys judges? Like, I judge. And I was like, this was a slam dunk victory. It wasn't even close. And so I'm like, he's going to come back like Flex Lewis and just dominate and probably get the record to most titles. But it must be really hard to hold back. You're seeing yourself improving, getting bigger, and you don't want to just look the same at 212. Although you could probably just come back year after year. 
but but you don't want to. It's hard to hold back. And so can you describe that? Like when you go to the gym, would you be satisfied as, for example, a 10 time 212 champion? Or would you prefer to be a top five competitor in the open class right now and just battle it out, perhaps not win, but be in that mix? Or could you settle for 212 and consider health in that ramification as well? I'm sure it's a lot healthier to just stay at 212 rather than try to push 260, 270 in the offseason and come back bigger and better every single year. Well, first, thank you for uh, giving me such good good um, props on last year's victory and how you saw it. Um, I, I, I want to address that real quick and say, you know, if it wasn't for my competitors, especially Sean Clarita, Kamal, those guys, they train hard and they're phenomenal bodybuilders. And without them, you know, pushing me, I don't think I would have been my, or at, let's just say I wouldn't have been as good as I was last year. So I have to thank them. And, um, you know, yeah, I, like I said, the plan has been to come back to, to defend the title and, um, and then moving on to your, to the second part two of the, you know, yeah, I definitely have always seen myself eventually being an open competitor. I know that just like Flex Lewis, that 212 weight cap uh, restricts uh, some bodybuilders from being their absolute best. And so my thought is, is if, if my body does grow out of the 212 division, I would be more than happy in going open. And so whether that's this year, next year or whatever, um, but, but as far as, you know, competing in the open, if I were to go to the open, I would be challenging for that title. And I don't want to say that, you know, I don't want to put myself up there as if, you know, I'm the Mr. Olympia, you know, front runner. I'm just saying that I believe that with my genetic potential, the work that I put in the physique that I've already built and will continue to build, I believe I'll be, you know, challenging for that title. And at the end of the day, regardless whether it's up, it's not even up to me, but I get to present my very best physique. And that's what we're here to do is to build our best physique. It bodybuilding is so much more of art than it is a competition to me anymore. When I first got into this sport, it was purely competition. I want to beat everybody. Now I see it for what it really is. You have your competitors who motivate you to be better and to be your best, to push you harder, but truly it's just your work of art that you're building. So yeah, both, I think I can be a much better bodybuilder having more weights on me, building more muscle tissue, but I also think I can challenge for that open title as well. And personally, I 100% agree. And for me, bodybuilding, what I liked about it was being better, getting better, improving. And I was able to do that. I started lifting weights at 10 and I got my pro card only at 35. I wasn't at my biggest and best until I was in my forties. And then after that, I mean, father time's coming and I'm not going to be my best physique ever. I switched down into classic physique, but it's really not as fun when you're not improving. And so personally, I'm probably not going to compete again unless there's maybe a, a natural show or something where I can just do that maybe at the age of 50 or something. My health is really important, but I do bike racing now and I can get better in bike racing. And it's the chase for getting better. That's really fun for me. And so for you, I can't imagine staying at 212 at this point would be as fun. It sounds like you don't care about just winning. You want to just be better. And so wouldn't it make more sense to just change right now? Like, why aren't we just deciding today, right now, I'm moving to open? Like, why do 212? It doesn't sound like you want to. Greg, you're getting me motivated over here, man. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the time's coming where we're going to have to decide because the competition season is ending and, you know, the Olympia is right around the corner. So it's like, you know, my weight is still over 250 and I'm, I am making solid progress and, like I said, I will have to shave muscle tissue off of my body to make that 212 weight cap. Um, believe me, man, I, I am all on board with whatever Hani's plan is. He is my coach, and I know that he has a, a solid plan of action for this year. And if we are to come in uh, at that 212 mark, we're going to nail it. If we come in at, you know, 225, 230 as an open competitor, I'm more than happy either way. And he knows I'm giving 100%. And uh, either way, it's going to be super exciting because either the two, well, regardless, the 212 and the open have stacked lineups 
every year, especially the last couple of years and this year. So either I come back and I come to defend the 212 title, and that's a super exciting storyline that everybody can get behind, or you have the 212 Olympia champion, the current reigning champion, going to open and challenging for that Mr. Olympia title and, and challenging those top five guys. So either way, I'm pumped. I'm ready to train. And you're right, man. It's, it's chasing your best. It's, it's, it's a challenge. I love, I love being challenged and um, mainly challenging yourself. You know, I'm not, not just out here challenging these guys. I want to challenge myself to be better every day. And that's exactly why I fell in love with bodybuilding, which is also why I fell in love with wrestling for bodybuilding, was that every day is an opportunity to get better. And it's a quote that I, I live by and I say all the time. It's a great day to get better. Every day is a great day to get better. So that's something that is, you know, uh, true to me. And is that my core is every day is an opportunity to get better. And I want to make the most of it. Yeah. And, and from just talking to you and, and answering these questions, it just seems like how could you possibly go down to 212? As soon as you said lose muscle, bodybuilding, there's no losing muscle in bodybuilding. I just can't see it being fun for you. To me, I see doing the 212 as like an easy win. But like what – Honestly, what placing would you have to get where you would feel it's better to be in open? Like, for example, let's just say you get fifth in open. Is that better than winning in the 212? What about third in open? Where is the exact number? Maybe it's financial or just for your yeah. own ego. Where is that number? Like, how good would you have to do in open? And where do you think you'd place this year? Never mind the years down the road. I think you could probably win years down the road. But let's talk about right now, before you put on your true maximum size, what place would you get? And would that be better than winning the 212? You know, I've heard a lot of people say, or I would say a handful of people say that top five, top six would be a great placing for myself. For me, um, truthfully, I believe I'm in the mix for the top three and the top three, really the top five, you know, all have argument to, to, you know, challenging for that title. So top five, top six is what some, some are saying for me as a competitor and what I truly believe, I believe I'll be in that top three mix. And, you know, as well as the last couple of years, every, every guy in the top three had an argument to, to winning that title. So that's where I see myself is, is, is going to be within that top three call out. Yeah. And so for me, top three without question is better than winning the, the 212. Like, I feel like the, the, there's more money. The prizes are going to be higher. It's better for your, probably for your brand to, to win in the top three, as opposed to being the winner of the 212. But what if you got fifth? Like, let's say it was disappointing. You didn't maybe meet, hit the mark, maybe not as conditioned as you could have been, but like, you get fifth. Would that be a disappointment or would it still be better? Um. I don't know if disappointment is the right word or not. It might be. Shoot, I don't know. Um, but I see this as a bigger picture than it used to be. For me, it was every year. Um, if I didn't get what I wanted, then it was devastating, and it really, it really shook me up. Now, and I can't say I'm bulletproof to this, but now I see a bigger picture. I do believe that I can and will be possibly – uh, a future Mr. Olympia two division champion. Um, so again, with the, me looking at the bigger picture, assuming I would place fifth, well, this is just, this is where I am now and I need to continue to improve to get closer to winning that title. Uh, same as if I were to place third, because like I told you before, if I were to be coming into a competition, I'm not coming there to say, okay, I hope I place fourth or fifth. I'm not here to even say I want to play second or third. I'm here to win, man. Right. I, hard. I still want that title. That title is the most prestigious title in all bodybuilding. You have to want it if you love this and you're and, and, and you're competing at the highest level. You can't just do it because, oh, you know, I'm just happy to be here. I'm here to win, man. Um, but at the end of the day, like I said, this isn't this is a work of art and it great masterpieces, you know, take time and so I know if it's not this year, the next year, the year after, I'm going to continue to improve to, to be able to, you know, have a great shot at winning that title. And I believe hopefully I will. And to me, it seems it's no different than Nick Walker's attitude because he's made so much improvements. He wants to eventually win the title. And I know you've trained in the same gym as him. You, you see him. Um, and so there's no reason why you don't, 
or shouldn't feel the same way. He's making big improvements. He said, hey, I'm going to win this show, and he does. You've been making big improvements, and when you guest pose, it was obvious to everyone. And so there's no reason to think you're not going to continue to make these gains and improvements in size and, and conditioning and everything. And so why not? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm not in the gym training every day, year round to just be the same. I'm, I'm here to be better every year. And even in the 212, the last five years, I've improved every year with being around roughly the same weight. So, you know, given that, you know, my direction is open in the future, you know, that will give me opportunity to, you know, gain more weight, more size and get more 3D and better conditioning. So, yeah, I, I think that I think as competitors at the highest level, we need to be gunning for that title. Let's get into the diet a bit. Like you've been able to make such big improvements, but yet I don't see you bulking and cutting the way that you see typical bodybuilders are getting really sloppy in the off season. We, we saw you guest pose after all those improvements you made, yet you still had the crazy six pack, the small waist and everything. And so are you a big fan of like eating five, six, 7,000 calories a day to put on the size or like, Give us an idea, like how many calories are you eating and what kind of body fat percentage you think you need to maintain in the off season to kind of put on size? Like obviously you're not going to walk around four or 5% body fat, but like is 10, 12 enough? And, and how many calories you need? How many calories do you eat when you're on a diet? Yeah. So if you guys haven't seen, I know you did a, you did a, a review of my full day of eating on my YouTube channel where I put out a lot of content for my training, nutrition, lifestyle, all that. Um, but I would say, first of all, I don't even like the word bulking. The word bulking to me just means eat like garbage and get fat. Mm. Uh, that's, that's where I come from. That's what I, I would always hear. That's what the guys would look like who would say I'm on a bulk. So for me, it's, you know, I'm in a phase of trying to gain lean muscle tissue, right? I'm trying to, I'm trying to gain strength and lean muscle tissue. I would say once my body fat gets to that, 10 to 12 percent uh mark i would say that's plenty for an off-season bodybuilder i'm not saying i haven't been above that i'm just saying that i think that 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 10 is a eight eight to 12 percent body fat off-season is a solid um place to be in your off-season to grow lean muscle tissue as far as calories I usually count more macros than I do overall calories. I usually make sure that I'm getting enough, enough protein. And then I will break that down into about five to six meals. And I will do the same thing with the carbs and the fats. Well, can and you give us the macros and I can just add the calories right on the spot here? Like just so that we give an idea. I would say just, just quickly and easily. Let's say let's do about 300 grams of protein. Let's do about, let's do 400 grams of carbs. And then let's do about 90 grams of fat. So about 3,600 calories a day on average. And I'm, like, I'm thinking most people are sitting here and thinking, there's no way this guy only eats 3,600 calories. It must be five, <laughs> six, seven, eight thousand, 8,000 because all bodybuilders eat 10,000 calories. But you're hearing it from Derek. He's not bullshitting you. I just did the math real quick. 3,600 calories a day. I eat about 3,500, but I'm racing bikes. So I'm burning off those calories. And so if you're listening to this advice, he just said 8 to 12% body fat for bodybuilders is a good place to be. And that's exactly where the athlete zone is for body fat percentages. And so if you're watching this video and you're thinking, hey, should I eat more? He's eating 3,600 calories a day. Does he look like he needs to eat more? And so why are you eating 4,000 calories? You're skinny fat. you got 25%. You can't see any of your abs and yet you're force feeding a cheeseburger thinking you're going to look like Derek in the future. It doesn't work like that. Stop eating so much. I tell people, <laughs> look down at your stomach. Look down right now. If you can't see abs, you are eating enough. <laughs> Simple. Well, you're, you're giving it to him straight, I guess. <laughs> and so... Have you made changes this year? Because like the changes that we saw at the, at, at the guest posing, that was so much more muscle with that same conditioning. Is there something you did this year that changed from last year? Has your chain training changed like longer workouts, different time under tension? Or are you a big fan of volume or like, tell us about the training tips that have gotten you this physique. Yeah. So when I, let me just take it back. When I very first started bodybuilding, I would look up 
on YouTube. I type in Jay Cutler chest workout and I would watch his full workout and I would go to the gym and I would mimic it for myself and, and push myself uh, like he did in the gym. So that's how I started. Fast forward, I kind of got away from that training style because that was kind of my bread and butter, the way Jay or Phil uh, Heath would train. And then I, I got away from that training style. So when I when I went to Hani, Hani Rambod, as my coach uh, after the 2022 Olympia, he put me through his FST7 workouts. And then I it clicked in my head. I thought to myself, wow, no wonder I seen such good progress in the beginning of my career. And, the, my, and then in the middle of my career, when I switched my training, my improvements kind of halted for a little bit. And then moving to the FST7 workouts, this is the same kind of workouts that I was having before when I was watching Jay and Phil. Oh, duh. He coached Jay and Phil. <laughs> there you go. So, so that's, that's what I recognized was doing more of the FST seven um, workouts, which that is definitely less rest and more intensity in the gym, a lot more volume. We will do like preloading the muscles by doing like five to seven sets back to back to back 30 to 40 seconds rest in between. And we're really, really getting a burn uh, in the muscle at the very first exercise. And so when we move on to the second exercise, which is going to be more of like a heavier, more compound movement, then we will use a little bit more rest time and we'll go heavier and we'll do more straight sets and we'll do that for a couple exercises throughout the middle of the workout. And at the end, we'll do more FST7 style uh, exercises to where we're really getting the maximum blood flow, maximum pump, and overall muscle fatigue at the very end of the workout. So we put that in the beginning, at the end, high intensity. And then we kind of slow it down in the middle, go heavier, and do more straight sets. And then at the end, we'll you know finish off by smoking the muscle with like an FST7 um, sets. And so definitely a brutal workout. And like, are you the next day, like, are you, is your back sore? Are you feeling it? Like how, what level of intensity? Like, are you training until you're sore the next day? And how long before you can hit that body part again? Yeah, I've been pretty sore recently. I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> but the training has been good, right? I'm trying to build strength. So as we're increasing the weight, my body is getting shocked. It's not used to the, the increased load. So therefore I should be a little bit sore for a few days. And yeah, like if I, let's say um, I hit legs or something and I go to sit on the couch and I, I try to get up, it's going to take me an extra, extra minute to get up. My muscles are fatigued. They are sore. And I'm walking around like a cowboy half the time, just waddling across the, across the room. So yeah, I think you should have a little bit of soreness, but if your soreness is lasting, four, five, six, seven days, I think you actually probably should back it off just a little bit. Truthfully, I don't think you should be that sore for that long. I think if you're sore for three, two, three days, you can get right back to it the fourth or fifth day. I think that's most optimal. And so listen, people, this is for advanced lifters. He's not saying a beginner should go in there and train and get sore and all this stuff. And so my advice would be, if you're a beginner, you know, you can back off a little bit. You don't have to go crazy, intense failure. But if you're an advanced lifter, if you're not getting sore and you're not pushing yourself really hard, you're not going to get the results that you could be. Exactly. You definitely need to, to feel a little pain to get a little gain, you know? Yeah, and my motto, train harder than last time. And so you're going to the gym and you're finding ways to push yourself, whether it's a drop set or uh, a set with only 30 seconds rest, jump to the next one and you feel that burn and soreness and you're doing everything to make sure that you're getting a really, really hard workout. Absolutely. And like I said, doing those that preload in the beginning or the finisher at the end, if you're doing that preload, like the the, the maximum pump, the the, you know, major muscle burn in the beginning of your workouts where you feel like, Oh my God, I don't even want to do anything else after the first exercise. That's good. That way you don't have to go nearly as heavy in the next uh, couple exercises and you can get the most out of the full workout rather than saving it till the very end to, to kill it. 
That sounds like you're leaving your ego at the door, burning yourself out so that you don't need to lift crazy heavy weights because obviously you're super strong. You, if you max out on the bench and do really heavy squats, a lot more chance to get injured. And so that could set you back months. So, so you got to be really safe. And I think a lot of people go to the gym and they keep that. They don't keep that in mind. They don't think, well, I got to do this safely. People are lifting too heavy, sloppy form, trying to show off how heavy and strong they that they can lift. And you're just saying, no, don't do that. Try to exhaust yourself before you lift really heavy. That way you don't need as much weight. Absolutely. And, and let's not get it twisted. There's times where I may have an ego day where I really want to come in and kill it and see how much I can lift. But like you said, I really got to make sure that I leave the ego at the door and I'm here to get most out of the workout to be the best bodybuilder I can be. Yeah. And for the most part, the professional bodybuilders, they're the ones that I've seen the bodybuilders train and you look at them and they're training with such good form. They're slowly lowering the weight down. They're using good mind muscle connection. They're not using crazy heavy weights and they have the biggest muscles versus the younger guys. They're lifting heavier weights than the pros, but with sloppy form and they get hurt. Yeah. I like uh, Lee Haney's quote, stimulate, don't annihilate. We're there to stimulate the muscle and improve the muscles, you know, as like, like we talked about a body of, of work, a body of art, but uh, we're not really caring too much about moving a, a weight from point A to point B. That would be more of the um, power lifter, CrossFit, strongman style training. Whereas me, yes, we're moving weights, but we're stimulating the muscles is what we're trying to focus on. Great advice. Um, moving on to conditioning. Um, at the last year's Olympia, you were just absolutely peeled. In the past, you were slightly off, cost you the title. What has you? What have you learned throughout the years? That kind of now you have like the the formula. What is it? Has has it been being leaner in the off season? Has it been doing cardio year round or only doing cardio at the end? Like, what are the secrets? Why are you getting leaner now? What what have you figured out? Well, last year was the first time I worked with Honey Rambod, and it's not just to be here and shout him out, but I have to give him tons of credit because he helped me tremendously after the 2020 Olympia going into the 2021 Olympia. So everything we did from the nutrition, training, supplementation, everything, cardio, he did completely different than I've ever done in the past. Before, I was doing like two hours of hit cardio. So I do like an hour uh, uh, in the morning, hour in the evening of hit cardio on the elliptical, really burning my legs up. Uh, that's why they would come in flat and smaller. And also, I was eating almost nothing. If you go back to my videos a long, long time ago, I was eating basically fish, white fish and, and vegetables for like six meals a day. I was eating no fat, hardly any carbs and just basically, you know, fish for protein. Um, as far as training, I actually think that, you know, me having longer workouts that were not as intense, they were, they were still very hard workouts, but they were like, I was giving myself more breaks and I think just putting it all together and training harder this last year, doing more optimal cardio, doing more steady state on like a stairs um, and not all the way into the show to where I would actually back it off a little bit and do like more of a treadmill walk. And then also the nutrition, I was actually able to eat a little bit more food going into the show than I was in the past where we would load really hard, you know, the night before after making weight. And this time we were able to keep food in consistently throughout the entire prep. So things were just a lot more consistent than they'd ever been. And I could tell that Hani knows what he's talking about. So having him in my corner is a big, big difference. And um, also the mindset too. We can't forget about the mindset. Finally, just going, you know what? I don't care. Whatever happens, happens. I'm here to win. I want to do my best, but I believe I'm going to present my best package. And, you know, it's not up to me. Uh, just kind of like letting that pressure go was probably one of the, the best things that I could have done for, for last year's Olympia and peaking properly. It's easier said than done. Everybody wants to not feel that pressure, but you really have to be able to not internalize the hype or anything else. And you just say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best and whatever happens happens. I'm here to have a good time and present my best. And that's it. So I think also the mindset is very important when peaking because if you're stressed and you think oh my god i've done 
so many weeks, so many months of this hard training and this hard dieting. And I'm, what if I don't show up at my best? Well, if you're, if you're worried about it, you may not show up at your best because you're going to be stressed out. And, and, and I think that the body, the body definitely is controlled by the mind. So being able to control your mind is very important. Hani sounds like a great coach. And I like what you've said about the mindset. And personally, I can so I can relate so well. Like when I was training for world championships for powerlifting, and I'm thinking, like, well, what if I don't win? What if I don't break the record that I've been set out for? Like there, I put so much pressure on myself to perform that it was screwing up my day. It was always something that was on my mind. It was messing up my training. And then finally I'm like, look, I, I said something in high school, just stop giving a shit. And so I'm like, I'm going to go for it. And if I can actually win, good. And if I can't, I did my best. And so once you just kind of relax and let things go and just go with the flow and have fun, that's when the success comes. If you're always putting pressure on yourself and you think I need to be perfect. And if I miss one thing or do this, now my show's over, that can ruin it. Getting back to the, the hit cardio and whatnot, two hours of hit cardio. And what you said, you switch to steady state. I'm a huge fan of steady state. There's a big debate in the bodybuilding world, whether you should do steady state cardio or hit cardio. A lot of people think hit cardio, the afterburn burns more calories. But like you said, it ruins your legs. You're going so hard that you don't have the energy to train hard on the squats. And so I'm a big fan of doing steady state cardio. Now, mind you, I compete in bike racing. So I'm doing a lot of hit cardio and, and, and as well as steady state, but it's certainly taking its toll in the gym. I can't train nearly as hard on legs as I used to, but my goals are different. I want to improve my cardio. But if you're listening to this and you want to know what to do, you don't have to do hit cardio to get lean. Just go for a walk do some steady state, just moderate pace cardio, and you'll burn off the calories and you'll get the results. And it's beneficial for your heart. Absolutely. And I don't dislike hit cardio. As a matter of fact, I love doing hit cardio. It's just not the most optimal for me to be my best as a bodybuilder. So that's yeah, I love hit car. Like I love the challenge. Like anyone that likes lifting weights and going to failure, we're kind of like torturing ourselves. Like we like that feeling of pushing ourselves. And when I'm doing hit cardio, I'm sprinting up a hill. I like it. I like to see how hard can I push myself. But if your goal is to just to burn some fat, you don't need to go to those extremes. Exactly. Totally agree. Is there any tips that you would give to the young aspiring bodybuilders? The, there's a lot of death that have happened in bodybuilding lately. They're, you're looking at pro bodybuilders and fitness influencers getting heart attacks, John Meadows, and so on. We all know these names. And so is there any advice that you could give to the younger generation, the, the teenagers thinking, well, maybe I don't want to be a bodybuilder. Maybe I shouldn't lift weights. Like, What would you tell that young, that teenager that's getting into bodybuilding, knowing what's going on? What would you tell that person? Yeah, health is super, super important. The most important thing. You know, that's something that Hani and I both have addressed in the very beginning. He said, your health is number one and there's life after bodybuilding. So he always makes sure to drill that in my head. You know, getting routine blood work is very important. Um, also, what I'll say, because honestly, sometimes, you know, these things that have happened in our industry where people have gone too soon, you know, it, it bothers me. It really does. I'm not going to lie. It's something I think about a lot. And, you know, it, it, it almost can make you question, you know, what, what, what am I doing? You know, is, you know, I'm any athlete, any athlete is pushing their bodies to an extreme, right? Whether you're a football player or a, a marathon runner or a bodybuilder or whatever you do, if you're an athlete, you're pushing yourself uh, as hard as you can. So, it almost makes you makes you question that. And then I think to myself, but wait a minute. Why why did I start doing this? Oh, because I love it. And this is who I am. And this is what I'm put on earth to do. Like I am a bodybuilder through and through. I wouldn't even be able to be myself if I wasn't bodybuilding, regardless of an Olympia or not. Like if it wasn't for the Olympia, I would still be in the gym training anyway. So once I realized that halfway through my body, my competitive bodybuilding career, I realized like I'm not stopping because the, I remember why I started. I remember the passion that I have for training and being in the gym and, and sculpting my physique and getting better every day. So 
that's my, probably my biggest advice is to anyone that wants to be a bodybuilder, an IFBB pro, an Olympia competitor, or a Mr. Olympia one day, is you always have to remember why you started and the love that you have for bodybuilding and training. Because there's going to be times, whether it be uh, health reasons, financial reasons, or com- reasons that you thought, oh, I could have done better at a show, and it all these distractions of why you think, oh, maybe I don't want to do this anymore. And you got to remember, oh, this is why I started. This is why I want to continue. And I'm going to follow through because this is who I am. And I committed to myself. So always remember the love that you have um, for bodybuilding and for competing. Exactly. Do it because you love it. That's the message I'm hearing. Like so many people, they start bodybuilding and they, they don't love it. They just maybe want the followers on Instagram or to post a transformation and they don't even love it. And I'm like, if you don't want to do a show badly, don't do a show. Like you should be like, I can't wait to do the show. When I did my first show and I saw the, the poster and there's a bodybuilding and I didn't know those body, I'm in high school. And I'm like, there's a thing called bodybuilding where you like flex. I'm like, I've been training since I'm 10. What are you, are you kidding me? I can't wait to do that. I dieted for whatever, six months to do this show and then found out it was provincials. You had to do the novice show first. This is before the time of the internet, really. I'm that old. And I'm like, Oh, I died for nothing. Oh, well, when's the nut? When's the, when's the novice show in four more months? All right. I'm doing that show. I was so excited. It was, uh, I loved it so much. And once I did my first show was addicted to it. I've done 59 shows since then. Think my first show was in 1994. And so my advice for people find the sport that you love. And if you're saying, Hey, I want to be a bodybuilder. You're 18, 19 years of age. You don't love training. Don't do it. Don't be a body. You have to love the gym. Getting up on stage, that's a reward at the end of all the hard work that you put in. You get to show off all that work you did. It's like making a painting. You drew a painting for six months and finally have this masterpiece and you show it at the art show. This is bodybuilding. Yeah. And one thing I noticed too across the board, and it usually happens more at the NPC level and first time competitors rather than the the IFBB Pro League, the pros and the Olympians is you'll get a lot of competitors at two, three, four weeks out. They just drop out of the show. They stop dieting. They stop training. They don't want to do the show anymore. And that right there is the absolute hardest time. Those last few weeks leading into a show, believe me, guys, you know how many times that I've literally just wanted to throw in the towel and say, Oh my God, I can't handle this another day. This is, this is really becoming unbearable for me. This is hard. You know, you gotta, you have, you're running on low energy, you're running, running on E and you have to wake up, you do your cardio and your whole days revolved around bodybuilding and, and you got birthdays and friends, you know, messaging you, or maybe you don't, and you just, you got to go to the gym and train and you're like, God, how do I even get up off the couch to train, you know, but the thing is following through and doing the show, you will realize you will be so thankful that you just finished it and did it. And again, this is mostly for the first time competitors because those who have competed before know what they're getting themselves into. A lot of times, first time competitors, they don't realize how tough it is and how low energy you are towards the end. And those last couple of weeks can be a make or break. So just follow through and, and, and finish what you started and you'll be so happy and thankful that you did. And it's something that you will have as a memory for life. I will never forget my first show ever. Absolutely. The challenge, you don't know just how hard it is unless you've actually done it. And people just, it's hard to describe that feeling, but like if you're climbing a mountain, it's easy at the start. You're fresh. You got lots of air. You get to the top days later, the air is thin. You're exhausted and you're still trying to climb that mountain. But when you plant that freaking flag at the top or get up on stage and flex the feeling un freaking believable. Like uh, that's why I've done it for decades. Another example it's like running a marathon every day. Like you might not think it's that hard, but trust me, it starts easy. Fat comes off. It's easy. But as you get closer to peak week and so on, it feels like you're running a marathon every single day. And so if you're trying to do a show, realize the challenge is real. It's going to be hard. But if you can actually do it, you're one of that 1% of special kind of people that can actually go through with something that hard. And everything in life after that, to me, it's easy. You can accomplish anything. If you can do a bodybuilding show and stick to it, 
jobs, relationship, all that stuff. If you put the same amount of educa- dedication towards that as you did in your show, you can do anything. Absolutely. Said it perfectly. Okay. So I, I think that was a great interview. Lots of great questions being answered. Did you want to leave anything to anything that we didn't cover or bring up any topics that you might want to share with the, the audience? Um, I think we covered a lot of topics and I really appreciate you having me on. If you guys don't follow me on Instagram, please give me a follow. Um, also, I have my YouTube channel as well. If you guys would want to subscribe and follow along. I put out a lot of training, nutrition, content, as well as just, you know, day in the life, kind of get to know me stuff. Um, it's a lot of stuff that when I was saying earlier, I watched Jay Cutler and a lot of the other uh, pro bodybuilders whenever I first started. It's the same kind of content that got me motivated and helped me learn to how to be a bodybuilder. So that's the same stuff that I like to put out on my channel too. So if you guys uh, want to check that out, you're, uh, I'd, I'd encourage you to. And once again, Greg, I really appreciate you having me on and I hope to talk with you again soon. And so highly encourage you, right? Derek Lunsford, go follow him on YouTube. You're going to see him like training and eating and from a real guy. You've seen him talk. He's normal, 36. He's not bullshitting you. He's not going to say I eat 6,000 calories. He's telling you the straight up facts. Highly recommend you go follow him. Also, you can check him out on Instagram and let's cheer for him. Let's hope he does the open. You changed your mind at the start of the year. I was like, no, I want him to do 212. I want him to win forever and ever and just keep dominating. But I'm hearing you say uh, losing muscle and wanting to, you can't compete at 212 and lose muscle if your goal is to keep getting better. So let's see you do the open class. I think that's what most people want to see. Cheering for you to do, hopefully a top three finish and then eventually win maybe the year after. Thanks so much, Greg. I really appreciate you, man. All right. And so- Best of luck to him. And until next time, we're out.